Today's sponsor is Ground News. Now, if there's one thing that we can all agree on, it's that the media landscape is fundamentally broken. Both social media and the press are incentivized to exaggerate our differences and amplify division. A lot of people ask me where they should go for news that they can trust, and I don't usually have a good answer for that. However, Ground News has taken a totally different approach in improving the broken media ecosystem. They're a news comparison platform, giving you the ability to compare how sources with different political biases are covering a certain story, so you can easily see if it's being spun to fit a political narrative. You can click on any article and see how balanced the coverage is. The blind spot feature allows you to see stories that are exclusively being covered by either the left or the right. This allows you to identify news that you may otherwise miss in your own bubble. Ground News is an apolitical platform. It's a place for moderates, conservatives, liberals, and the politically homeless. Try it for yourself today by downloading the free Ground News app on the App Store or Google Play Store. Just go on the store and search for Ground News. Highly recommend it. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we've got on my friend, Michaela Peterson, who is, of course, the host of the Michaela Peterson podcast. Welcome. How are you doing? Great. How are you doing? I'm always good, Michaela. Always good. Um, so we were just talking before about the fact that we're both looking at the world and we are planning on escaping our countries of origin or perhaps have already done so. So first of all, <laughs> what do you, what's your past year been like? What's it been like for you? Well, um, the majority of my problems were caused because my dad was incredibly ill. So the last year has, was t- absolutely terrible. Um, and COVID was almost the least of our issues. Mm. Um, so I was in Moscow, January, 2020, and then I was in Florida and then I was in Serbia. I finally got back to Canada in September, uh, with my dad and then Canada was a little bit open, not as open as Serbia, way more closed, but it was still a little bit open. And then November, everything shut down. So they're in like lockdown, stay at home mandate. And it, it just ruined downtown. So I live in a condo building downtown and it just wrecked it. There's nobody downtown. The homeless population skyrocketed. There's tents everywhere. It's And people are just nervous outside. They're just scared outside. So that was great. So I was dealing with that, which is just hard mentally. And I mean, I'm fortunate enough to have an online job. So it's not like my job was impacted. And it was still unbelievably stressful. Um, And I'm not very stress tolerant, especially given the health crises I've been dealing with. So I'm already like, my nervous system's already shot. And then this was on top of that. Um, And then, so that that lasted, that started in November. Um, My dad finally started feeling significantly better in really in March, February, March. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I was like, okay, I need to, I don't have to like be here anymore. Um, I really need a break because mentally I was just like, I wasn't sleeping. Like I was just not doing well. And a lot of that was like concern about uh, my dad's health. And so as soon as that was done, I was like, I need to break. I need some sun. I was like pale. My vitamin D was at like zero from being basically in a cave for like six months. I was like, you know, I have the opportunity to leave and I cannot handle, you know, three more months of a freaking stay at home mandate. It's ridiculous. Like patios aren't open. Nothing is open. So I'm in Dubai now. Okay, man, that's a lot. I mean, (laughs) yeah, I mean, you, you've had a, you and your family have had a, certainly a rough last couple of years, but I mean, even, even prior to that, I mean, I've, watched a lot of your podcasts and, you know, I'm aware of your story, but for people who may not know, can you kind of just give like an, I guess just an overview of your story and some of the things that you've had to overcome because there's, there's a lot of it. Sure. So, um, the majority of my issues were, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder when I was seven, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and it was incredibly severe. Like you get kids and they'll have like an inflamed knee. I had something like 37 joints affected. Um, I didn't have my spine affected, but it was everywhere else. Like my jaw, it was just like in other joints that you don't think about having arthritis in. It was everywhere. Um, when I was 12, I was put on SSRIs for – I was having suicidal thoughts. Um, I was medicated. I was the first kid in Canada to be put on immune suppressants uh, for the arthritis. 
um, which initially helped, but didn't actually end up helping long-term. When I was 17, I had my hip and ankle replaced um, because the arthritis had destroyed my cartilage, even though I was on immunosuppressants. I'd been taking them um, for, I guess, almost nine years at that point. Um, And then I basically just got sicker and sicker and sicker, even though I was doing everything I could with the medical system. Um, By the time I was 22, I was on seven, I think it was seven medications. It was immune suppressants, SSRIs. I was taking painkillers, like just Tylenol 3 to sleep at night because my, the arthritis in my shoulders was really bad. Um, I was taking Adderall to stay awake. I was diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, which literally means, you know, you're really tired and we don't know why, Mm. um, idiopathic hypersomnia. So I had, um, like three seriously chronic conditions and my health was deteriorating. And then I started getting this rash that started when I was 19 and it just worsened. And so by the time I was 23, I had arthritis. I'd been diagnosed with bipolar um, and I had idiopathic hypersomnia and I had this rash and my skin stopped being able to heal. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was when I was 23. Um, I switched degrees from, I had been in psychology. I switched over to biomedical science and thought, I'm, I have to figure out this medical problem because it's killing me and I'm going to die. Like this is, if my joints are disintegrating and now my skin is disintegrating, this isn't, and the medical system is like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Like mm. I need to figure out something. And um, so I went back to school because I thought maybe I had to do a degree in immunology or microbiology or something. Uh, and eight months later, I found out there was a, a very, very large link between gluten and autoimmunity. Um, And a lot of people with autoimmune disorders don't know that, but there are a lot of autoimmune disorders that couple together. So if you have one, you're likely to have more eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, And gluten can be a trigger for a lot of people with autoimmune disorders. So I thought I got tested um, and I have the celiac gene, which is an autoimmune disorder associated with, with consuming gluten. And I was like, oh, maybe I just have celiac disease and all these other symptoms are just connected to that. So I cut out gluten. Uh, and that summer, and it helped a little bit, but okay. I thought, okay, if I'm really going to look into diet, I'll really get strict just to rule it out. And so I went to a very strict diet of like meat, certain root vegetables, like parsnips and sweet potatoes and greens. And after a month on that, um, my skin started to heal. I lost three pant sizes, even mm-hmm. though I only lost five pounds. So that was really dramatic. and quite lovely. Um, (laughs) I, my arthritis was feeling better, but mostly I noticed my skin was healing and I was like, this is absurd. And then in the next three months, I'll, I'll shorten this up because it could go on forever. But in the next three months, I, um, I went off of all my medications. And so I went off of my immune suppressants because I wanted to actually monitor the flare ups to see if I could correlate them to what I was eating. Mm -hmm. Um, I went off of Adderall because I, the idiopathic hypersomnia went away in about three months. I wasn't tired anymore. I wasn't pass. I was literally passing out. So I went from passing out to having energy. Mm-hmm. So I stopped the Adderall. Um, and then I thought, you know what? I don't, I don't want to take any of these medications, but the huge trigger was about three months into this diet, my depression lifted and my depression hadn't lifted for my like entire life. I can't remember not being depressed. And it lifted in November in Canada, which is, it starts to get dark and gloomy and it's not when you'd expect to not be depressed. And I was like, oh my God, maybe this is associated with, like maybe all these health problems are associated. They all seem to be lifting at the same time. And so I stopped my antidepressants and I only stopped them over about a two week period. And I was on a very high dose of SSRI and I'd been taking it since I was 12, 11 or 12. And it turns out you can have withdrawal from SSRIs. And I had absolutely no idea that that was a thing because I'd heard of like opiate withdrawal, but I didn't know that psych medication has withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people still don't know that. And for the next two and a half years, I had sensitized my brain by just removing this medication. I had no idea what was going on. Um, And I sensitized myself to anything inflammatory. So lights bugged me. Um, Temperature changes bugged me. I couldn't sleep. Uh, but the, I guess the, the biggest thing that happened was I sensitized to carbs. So I was on okay. this very low carb diet. I was doing really well. And then I stopped my medication. Two weeks later, I tried to reintroduce soy. 
And I went on Rogan to talk about this. I was like, soy made me hallucinate. Mm. It took me like three years to figure out, oh, I was in SSRI withdrawal. I've talked to psychiatrists about this now who actually know. I was in SSRI withdrawal. I'd sensitized my brain. And when I like threw a whole bunch of fairly inflammatory food, like soy is not easy for people. I threw a bunch of soy at me and my brain just went haywire. So for the next year and a half, I was trying to introduce foods, having these wild autoimmune reactions, like psychiatric symptoms. Um, and so I kind of restricted my diet, restricted my diet, restricted my diet to try and like get sane because I was like, I, I found that sanity mm-hmm. and then I lost it for a very long time. And I ended up on just eating meat. I was like, I, I went down to meat and greens. I was like, I got a little bit better, but I still wasn't feeling good. And I was like, you know what? Steak doesn't, isn't hurting me. Steak isn't the problem. So mm-hmm. I figured I'd do steak for like a month and then to reintroduce things. Um, but it took longer to get my health back. So what I'm like, if you Google me or anything, you don't know who I am. I get a lot of, there's, there's negative articles associated with this, you know, all beef diet, all mm-hmm. meat diet. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was kind of forced into that from SSRI damage and autoimmunity. However, recently, I haven't talked about this at all, um, that those psychiatric symptoms that used to flare up when I ate carbs seem to not be there anymore. So I think that was purely damage from SSRIs and that's gone. Um, So now I'm still dealing with like, I haven't expanded my diet very much because I still get arthritic flare ups, but arthritis is, it's, it's like, yeah, I get joint pain. So I should not do that because long-term joint pain is going to cause damage. But these like psych symptoms that were caused by the sudden cessation of SSRIs, that was completely Mm -hmm. intolerable. So that seems to be gone. And now I'm here. And we are glad that you are here. That's uh, <laughs> that. No, honestly, it's 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 a lot to it's a lot for a young woman to deal with, and I admire the fact that you persisted through all this and worked out honestly using your own ingenuity. Um, what works for you? And yeah, some people are going to be like, "Oh, you only eat beef. That's really weird. That sounds crazy. Whatever." But I think very much when it comes to diet look, people should do what works for them, right? There are general, there are general rules depending on what you're trying to achieve that don't really change depending on who you are. But if you've got an autoimmune condition or something very specific, allergies, whatever, I'm very much in the camp of like, hey, if it works for you, cool, right? I'm not going to come and tell someone like, I don't want to just eat beef. But if that's what works really well for someone. I don't want to just eat beef. Yeah, yeah. I hate this. No, like honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I really do. I mean, like you think if I had to choose one food to only eat, it would probably be steak. So I was like, you know, thank God I don't have to survive (laughs) off of potatoes or something, but it's not ideal. Mm. Um, it's not ideal. Like I'm, I miss other things. Like, it's not like anyone's like, oh, thank God I don't have to eat fruit anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. What's the, what's the biggest thing you've learned through all of that through, cause that, that, that is quite the ordeal. Um, And it's not something that, honestly, it's not something that everyone, firstly, most people don't have to deal with stuff like that, let alone these multiple things stacked on top of each other. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But those who do often, you know, they, they sort of end up in a hole and they, and they stay there. Um, Whereas with you, I mean, you're super productive, you're achieving a lot of things, you're achieving a lot of successes. So what do you think is the core thing that you've learned through all that? Well, I would say the the reason I think I managed to get out of it, um, two reasons. So when I was in grade two and I was diagnosed with arthritis, my dad told me, you can never use this as an excuse. Mm. So people will get, and, and I mean, it was a serious autoimmune disorder. So if anyone's going to have an excuse, it's having a serious autoimmune disorder or having some sort of illness. Um, and he said, don't, don't use it as an excuse. And so that pushed me in the direction of, it it was a little, I went a little bit too far in that direction. So I was like, I I will never use this as an excuse. Um, when sometimes I should have spent the day in bed, like not pushing myself. Right. Um, so, so that was one thing that helped. And then the other thing that helped was when I was 23 and my skin stopped healing, I went to specialists and I was like, look, what's like help. 
like what's happening to me? And I had a couple of people and they're like, well, it's like, you're doing it to yourself somehow. Right. And I was just like, that's absurd because that mm. is like, I was, fr I was very anxious in those meetings, right? Like freaking out about this because it's a serious problem. And they're like, you know, got anxiety. Like it's, I was like, this, this isn't anxiety. And I completely, I, I completely switched from being, and from relying on other people, from thinking there's a doctor out there that's going to help me, which isn't an unreasonable thought um, because sometimes that's the right way to go. But I completely switched this, that around and thought, if I don't fix this, I'm going to die. Mm. And then I, I just focused on fixing it. So I only had one goal. So all I did all the time was read. I, I started with the rash, right? So I was reading research papers, trying to identify what rash I had. And eventually I, I did it. It took like months and months, but eventually I found the rash and that's what led me to gluten and that's what led me to diet. But um, I think it was, it was mindset and it was just, I, and I remember thinking I'm, a, I'm going to fix this or I'm going to die trying. Mm. Um, and so there wasn't a, there wasn't a reality in my head where I either fixed it or that's what I just did with my life. Gotcha. And then once that, once I switched that, I, I got into remission from this disease, these multiple disorders I'd had for my entire life in eight months. It was absolutely absurd. Mm. Um, I'd, been, I'd been researching, realistically, I'd been researching for about three years or four years off and on prior to that. But I went like full-fledged um, January and I went into remission for the first time in September and my depression lifted in November. Okay. So it was like, so a little bit, that'd be more than eight months, but, um, yeah. So mindset, I think changed. It's, I stopped awesome. relying on other people. I hear that. What's it like having Dr. Jordan Peterson as a dad? Exhausting. It's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> like people, pe people are like, oh, Jordan Peterson is your dad. Like, and I was like, Jesus, I've spent the last two five years just like trying to keep him afloat kind of because he's mm. like the change that occurred when he got more well known was so overwhelming that our family needed all hands on deck and then he had like he had autoimmune dis uh, issues so we had the same kind of dietary experience he stopped taking SSRIs because he didn't know about the withdrawal. That completely screwed him up. He was medicated with benzodiazepines to cover that SSRI withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And that is a not a good idea to do to people. That screws up people's brains. And some people are more susceptible to it. But if you take SSRIs for a long time and you suddenly stop and then you go into withdrawal and you add in a benzodiazepine, it just screws with your head. And so, yeah. no, for the last two years, I've been just trying to, I've been traveling around trying to find a doctor who knew what they were doing. And it was very difficult. Like I, I came across competent doctors, but realistically I researched for like, that's all I did for the last year. I researched yeah. and researched and researched and finally came up, kind of came up with a protocol that worked mm -hmm. and now he's mm -hmm. okay. But it hasn't like, I think I'm lucky because he taught me a lot of a lot of things that would increase my resilience probably. Like I think that lesson about not using your illness as an excuse, it can be just absolutely life-changing for people, especially if they're diagnosed as children, but even as adults, like yeah. that's really something people should hear is it doesn't really matter what it doesn't really matter what happens to you. If you use it as an excuse, you're just fucked. <laughs> if you're not real talk. And it, and people can have terrible lives like terrible mm. lives, but using that as an excuse just doesn't work. So it's been, it's been a wild ride. I would not trade it, but I definitely wouldn't have said I wouldn't trade it, you know, for the last year or so, but I understand that. I'm pretty happy about where we are. He's doing really well. Um, we've got tons of opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think we're scheduling a tour. So he's, he's doing way better than I've seen him in a really long time. So it's awesome. definitely been exciting. Awesome. It's it's great to see him back in the public sphere, putting out a new book, doing podcasts again. I like honestly, um over the past couple of years, I mean, I'll tell you real talk, my family has prayed for your family a lot over the last couple of years. 
I don't, um, I think <laughs> I have had so many messages about that. Like yeah. my mom got this impossibly deadly cancer mm. and then my dad repeatedly almost died for a long time. Yeah. And I had so many people messaging me being like, we've been praying. And mm -hmm. I honestly think we needed that because the, the events in the last couple of years don't make sense any other way. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it, so it's interesting because, um, I mean, I, I first, I first discovered your, your dad stuff back. It was, it wasn't 2016. It was so five years ago now it was before stuff got like to the, to the, you know, before the Joe Rogan appearances and before it's the book and Kathy everything kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well before that. Um, but I sort of introduced my, my parents specifically and also friends and stuff to things later on. And it was interesting because I went to the, um, when he was touring with Dave Rubin, I got invited to the talk, um, in Oxford, which is where I used to go to university. So I went to that and I was sitting next to your mom and uh dave That's rubin's random. i was sitting next to your mom and dave rubin's husband so i so it was funny so i was there and then i was like oh okay i've you know i've heard of tammy oh i've heard of dave okay cool like i'm meeting i'm meeting you now and so it's cool it's just like there's that kind of connection and then obviously i was on your podcast uh was it was it last year it was last year it was like right at the beginning yeah that was when i was got weird. in serbia or florida freaking out that was yeah. really not a good time Things uh, were not good. No doubt. But, I'm so, um, but anyway, anyway, I'm saying all that to say I'm happy that you, him, your mom, I'm just glad things are better because, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's it's a lot. You know, it was it was it was heavy. It was, lot, it was heavy yeah. for other people. So I can only imagine what it would have been like for you. Yeah, it was it was definitely unbearable. I'm writing a book. Um, I'm gonna finish it. I think I'm gonna finish it in the next month. Okay. It's called Could Be Worse. Um, and it's like, it's pretty intense. Uh, mm. I wrote, I've written down, like, I think part of it is just me trying to organize the events in my brain because I don't have like, it's, it's been such an absurd period of time for the last real, like realistically my entire life, but really the last like three years or so. And I don't have a solid narrative about like why things happen and why things make sense. So part of the reason I'm writing is for me, but it's been brutal. I'm like, I'm in September 2019 right now. So mm -hmm. I've gotten to there. And it's I can only write once a week because I need a number of days to recover. Um, and I'm just writing and bawling. And it's just like emotion I couldn't, I don't know, I couldn't process at the time that I've just stored. Mm -hmm. It's brutal. But it's going to be a, a pretty interesting book. Um, and I'm I'm really glad when it's out of my head. But it's been a wild ride. No that's doubt. That's for sure. What's your philosophy on why life throws these kinds of challenges at people? God, I don't know. I, I've switched between them. Like mm. for a while there, I told I told you I seem to err on the side of if something goes wrong, it's my fault. And that is a very difficult like perspective to live with, but it also gives you more control than if you just blame everything else. Mm -hmm. So for a while there, I thought everything that was happening to me, I had done something to not deserve it. I think that sometimes you're not paying attention in certain areas of your life. And you might have valid reasons to not being a pain, not be paying attention. Um, but then like life seems to just whack you with whatever yeah. you weren't paying attention to. And like 10 or 30 times more than you probably deserved. So for a while, I had this, I don't know, philosophy maybe that the aspects of your life you weren't focused on would just wallop you. <laughs> but I think that, I don't think that's exactly right. I think some of, I think sometimes it's just really unfortunate luck mm. because, well, like, I mean, I had arthritis since the age of two. What was I doing wrong as a two-year-old? Probably yeah. not much. So I don't know, like, I, you could say maybe it's to test you. Maybe it's to every time you overcome something, it makes you stronger once you get past the PTSD. Mm. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't, I have no idea. I can't, I can't, like I said, I don't have a narrative for the last like three years, especially I've tried mm. and I've tried a lot. I've tried meditation. I've tried like high dose shrooms, like make something <laughs> make sense. <laughs> 
Well, you know, it could also it could also be time. You know, I think that a lot of a lot of things happen in life where it takes time. It takes many years, perhaps in some cases even decades, to get to a stage where you can look back on something, and no matter how bad it was, even in a strange way, sometimes be grateful for it. Because, like you said, yeah. that is where you get strength. That is where you get resilience, etc. You can tell when people have had. I don't know. I mean, having no adversity is potentially far more dangerous than having a lot of it um, in the long run anyway. And in, in the short term, obviously, we don't we don't want to deal with <laughs> lots of problems and pain and suffering. But people who have had that in some way, shape or form do tend to end up being the most rounded and successful and ultimately perhaps happy human beings, I think. Yeah, well, I hope so. I think I'm too soon. I'm too close to a lot of the tra traumatic experiences. It's very yeah. recent that things have, have improved. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think time is a factor. And I think if you go through really difficult things and you can't turn and twist them around in your head and come up with a positive reason about why they happened, um, I think that they can just crush you. Like e yeah. even if the experiences weren't fair and they really hurt you if you can't turn it into something like, well, I learned, at least I learned this, mm -hmm. or I needed that experience to learn this, which led to that. If you can't do that, then you're just going to end up feeling sorry for yourself. And that's, you know, using whatever experience as an excuse. And then that's just going to ruin your life. Yeah. I think you have to control the framing of it. Um, yes. look, the, look, the truth is, and I mean, some, certainly something your dad talks about a lot, um, not in these words, but sometimes life sucks. Sometimes, you know, life is a beautiful thing. Life is a wonderful thing, but, you know, it, it sucks really sometimes. Like, it just, sometimes you'll just have a time where in one, you know, in one month, just bang, this happens, then that happens, then that happens, then that And you're just like, you know, I haven't done anything, um, but all these things are just colliding. And then also you have times where it's like, oh, wow, like this two month period here or this six month period, like everything's just on fire and you're Why killing it. And yeah, exactly. Um, a question I did have for you actually is it's been hard enough, certainly dealing with all of these things on a personal and a familial level, but what's it been like for you having it being so public? Um, okay. So not, it depends what aspect. It hasn't mm. been ideal. Like the the health stuff ha that hasn't been good. Like when we went to, I pulled dad out of a Canadian hospital because they were misdiagnosing him and they were going to do ECT, um, and that was going to destroy his memory and wreck him. Mm. And so I pulled him out of the hospital. My whole family, like we we sat down, we made a decision. Like ex everyone in my family, and we're like, yeah this is the right decision. And we brought him to Moscow. And the reason, I, part of the reason I went was because I wanted to. Um, and then because Andre is Russian, so he can communicate with the doctors, my mm -hmm. husband. So um, I pulled him out and went to Russia. And it was so risky because the Canadian doctor said, don't do it. Um, the medical procedure the the Russian doctors did worked, but it it was extremely dangerous. And I wouldn't recommend it to anybody unless they, unless they have no other option. And so, and I thought like, oh my God, if this doesn't, like my whole family agreed on this and it, it seems like the best option right now. My dad's agreed, like he mm -hmm. agreed as well. I didn't just tie him up and bring him there. Um, but if this doesn't work, the entire world is going to hate me and I won't have a dad. Damn. And that month in Russia, like, I don't think I've ever been as stressed as I was, uh, in Russia. Like I ended up, I was losing hair at one point and you have to be very, very stressed to like shed hair as mm. a human. You have to be pretty stressed to do that. Wow. So, and, and, and part of that was like, I don't know how this is going to turn out and I don't know how many people are going to blame me. Like, mm. this isn't just about me not having a dad and my family suffering. This is literally like, everyone's going to blame me that knows of my dad. I was like, mm. that's a lot to handle, but but I decided to, to do it anyway because I thought it was going to work, and it did. Thank God, or I would be like somewhere with a shaved head and a changed <laughs> name. <laughs> but, but, so, <laughs> it, like, it wasn't like having everybody watch was not ideal because they didn't see the whole story. They didn't see what it was like there. They just saw like crazy daughter takes, takes um, 
father to Russia to die. It's like, oh my God. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So no, it's not ideal. Yeah. It's a weird one. I mean, how do you find it in general? I mean, do you do you like being a public figure? Because I guess in some ha- in some ways, I think you kind of got dragged into it initially inadvertently. I think even your dad did, right? I don't I I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. I don't I don't have the uh I don't get the gist that he's someone who sort of set out to be as famous and well known as he currently is. Um if he were, I assume he probably would have pursued that several decades earlier. Yeah, sure. yeah, 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 exactly. Um so I think your whole family kind of got pulled into this spotlight to some degree, but I think it strikes me, it seems like you at some point made a conscious decision of, okay, actually, I want to go out and create my own platform here rather yeah. than, you know, hiding away from it per se. Because, for example, I know you have yeah. a brother, um, but, you know, I don't know much about your brother yeah. at all. He's obviously a lot more private, et cetera. So there must have been a conscious decision there. Yeah. Okay. So I wouldn't say that my dad was avoiding it because okay. he had uploaded all his lectures onto YouTube and some of them had a, like a pretty good number of views. He'd been recording his lectures since he was 29 teaching at Harvard. Mm. Right. So that was when that was way before YouTube existed. So he, he wasn't um, like averse to the idea of being in the public eye. I don't think um, the plan, like, I mean, nobody can plan to go viral. It's completely random. You would know that. So yeah. <laughs> Um, (laughs) so yeah, that wasn't planned, but I don't think like he was thinking of going into politics. He's not anymore. He was thinking Mm. of going into politics since he was maybe like nine. So, oh wow, okay. Yeah. So I think he, I think he has, it's not for, it's more foreign to me than it was to him, but mine was more of a choice. Um, I started, it started off because I was experiencing these random food intolerances and I couldn't find anything online leading me to any answers. I was like, am I just in, insane? Like what is happening here? Um, so I started a blog, the blog got, and I started talking about these food reintroductions and these symptoms that were like cyclical that I, I was keeping notes. I was like monitoring every symptom every day and they were following these patterns. So I, so I made it into a blog. Don't eat that. My brother named that. And, um, and that, so I went on a few podcasts because of the blog so that started. Then dad talked about my blog on Joe Rogan mm-hmm. and that just increased traffic like crazy. Um, and then when I went on the meat diet, I had articles written up about like this crazy beef diet. <laughs> so that went everywhere for a while. And I was like, oh my God, I was in Buzzfeed and things about this crazy beef diet. <laughs> and then Rogan invited me on to talk about the diet. Yeah. Um, and then since then I was like, well, part of it was, um, before I started the blog, I didn't really want to talk about it because my friends had no idea what was going on. I didn't really get a lot of support. I mean, even my family was like, well, it's definitely working, but this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I didn't have this like team of people behind me being like, yeah, Michaela cut out everything. That makes sense. It was all like, this is a little, this is a little off, but like Mm -hmm. you do you. Um, and then I, suffered for like a year and I kept getting walloped with these reactions where I'd get arthritis again. My rash would come back this horrible impending doom. Like, um, and this was just happening every time I reintroduced something. And at one point I was like, you know what, I have to start telling people about this because if anybody else out there is having this kind of reaction, like this is so isolating, it's driving me crazy. So that's, so I started it. I started like talking about diet because, um, I felt guilty not doing it. Like I was hiding Mm. it for a while, but I kept getting hit. And it was like, I was getting, like I talked about before, it's like, I was getting whacked with something that was like, talk about it, talk about it. Um, even though that doesn't exactly make sense, but I had this guilt about not talking about it. Like I was shirking responsibility. That's what it felt like. I get you. Um, cause I was like, I'm not crazy. This is definitely happening. It's probably happening to other people. And I felt like I was shirking something. So Mm. I definitely chose it. Plus I, I like it. Like it was, it was miserable um, when we were trying to help dad by taking him to other countries um, and that all that fell on me. Um, that So there's been miserable elements, but I mean, there's always going to be miserable elements to being more known. Mm-hmm. And the positive elements are so insanely positive that I wouldn't trade it. 
Um, and I've figured out how to deal with it a little bit. Like you block the people on Twitter who are like <laughs> basement dwelling. What's your block clubs. rule? Like what's your, <laughs> what's, what's, your, what's your block rule? How do you get blocked by Michaela? Not that I'm trying to, but. Oh, oh, I don't stand any of that. Like um, I had a comment the other day was like, which was just like, remember when you tried to lobotomize your dad? Like what? that's just a comment. You yeah, know, those are the comments I get. Yeah. I'm like, I don't, yeah. you can just like, you've got yeah. 30 followers. Like that's such a cruel thing to say, mm -hmm. especially considering he's like he's doing podcast. Like he's going on tour now. Like he's that didn't happen. It wasn't yeah. remember when you tried. It was remember when you lobotomized your dad. So yeah. that was somebody who got blocked last week. Okay. But most of the people who get blocked are ones that either tell me, tell me I'm some sort of slut or tell me I'm wrecking my dad's life. Oh, wow. And it turns out there were only about maybe 15 people doing that, which isn't actually very many people. Mm -hmm. But if you get one person hounding you on social media, it feels like way more. So I probably blocked maybe 15 or 16 people, something okay. like that. Was it um, and then it was like, oh, Twitter's fine now. Yeah. So <laughs> it, was, it, it felt like I was so sensitive because I was so – like there was a lot of responsibility in pulling my dad out of a hospital. Like that was a lot of weight. Mm. Um, and so any kind of poke just exacerbated fears I already had. And I was like, oh, I don't need that. No, no. Uh, yeah. Some people are remarkably persistent with it. Like incredibly, like they'll, they'll follow you even on multiple platforms and they'll just, yep. they just wake up in the morning and they're like, okay, it's time. Like, I'm just going to go after this. Per it's it's so bizarre to me from a psychological perspective. I have this thing, which is like, it's a gift and a curse, which is that I'm so interested in trying to understand the human condition, right? Like whether it's just how, how and why we do what we do individually and collectively, you know, it's why I'm interested in philosophy, politics, religion, culture, all of this stuff. Cause I'm just trying to understand human beings and there are certain people with certain mentalities where I'm just like, you know, I'm almost I like study. Yeah. I'm, I'm like studying the person who, yeah, yeah. who's trying to write that. And I'm like, yeah. why, why are you like this? Like what happened to you in your life that this is the way forward for you? You wake up in the morning and you're doing this consistently. It's not even just like, oh, this is a bad day. It's like, I'm going through your feed and every single thing going back for like a year. It's just going at this person, going at that person, going at that person. It's, it's mm -hmm. just bizarre to me. Yeah, I've been trying to. It took me until I feel like way too late in my life to realize that I wasn't like everybody else. Mm. Like no one's like everybody else, but I'm definitely not like everybody else. And I didn't I really didn't realize that until I was like 26 or 27. I was like, "Oh, I just assumed everybody thought like me." So when somebody acted differently than I would act in a certain situation, I was just like, "What are you doing?" Like <laughs> and I it, it took me a really <laughs> A really long time. Um, did it take, did you know that you were different earlier? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think I had sort of two realizations. I think I had one as a child. I had one in my childhood where I was like, okay, I'm different to most people, especially in my teenage years. One thing with me is okay. I've, I've always been very, very, I've always kind of been how I am. Like I've always been very strong willed and very like immune to peer pressure. So even as a teenager, when like, mm. you know, people were doing different things, you know, like, I don't know whether it's trying smoking or drugs or what, like, I was just like, no, like, you can't get me to do something that doesn't make sense to me. Like from smoking a cigarette to like wearing a mask outside, like you can't get me to do it. Like I, if it doesn't make sense to me, just because other people are doing it, I don't care. Like, that's not a reason for me. It has to make sense to me. And I've been like that since a kid. Um, so I, I had one realization really young. And then I think, again, in my late 20s, especially when I started putting more of my thoughts out there publicly, because I've been on social media for a long time, for over a decade, and I've always used it to promote my music. But um, when I started putting more of my thoughts and ideas out there, I quickly realized, oh, wow, you know, and people started gravitating towards me just like, oh, my gosh, like, you're a voice of reason, you know, like someone who's making sense throughout this thing. And I was like, oh, okay, is the way I think that rare? Like, I think that most, whether or not someone agrees with me on everything, I think I'm, I'm sensible and rational and like, I can explain 
what I do without being overly emotive about it. It's just like, okay, I believe this and here's the explanation. Um, but that was a second mm-hmm. point where I realized, okay, I'm really different. And then over the past 14, 15 months, I'm like, okay, I'm really, really, <laughs> really, <laughs> I'm really different. I go, I go to the supermarket or whatever. I feel like I'm an, I'm an alien or something and I'm observing a whole different species now. Like the past 15 months have been wild. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of the, it's not exactly, like I said, I, it did, I didn't clue until I was like 26. I'd had people tell me, mm. um, I'd had people tell me that I was different for whatever. I don't know if that was a positive <laughs> or a negative thing. It's like, Michaela, you're like, you're out there. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, I didn't get that until I was about 26. And then it's just been, be, it's been more and more obvious. And then, yeah, I would say COVID just because of the split in opinions and, mm. and fear who's fearful, who's not fearful. And you, there's, a huge divide in, in people. It's very, very interesting. And then I've also mm. noticed that I'm like, I'm ex- extremely open, which is, just comes at a cost, right? Cause it's like, everything is a good idea. Um, okay. <laughs> so like, ev- like everything's a good idea. I, and I, and I have to, like, I've made a rule where I'm like, okay, I shouldn't, if I'm interested in that in a week, then I'll continue it. Okay. Otherwise I'll just be like, you know, I've got, I've got so many things going on. I have so many projects and I'm like, uh, too open like hey you want to travel over here yeah okay let's go when are we going tomorrow (laughs) okay i'll move things around um and so that's yeah i don't think that's like my brother for instance um he's super smart but he's like in toronto he lives near my parents um he has like a newborn and a dog and a wife and they're all just pretty happy like just being more stable i guess yeah and I, th- I think I would just go crazy. Yeah. Go crazier. It's in- yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Um, yeah. People have such different personalities. And when certain, you don't get to see all sides of it until people are put in certain situations either. That's something I've really, really learned. So in the yeah. past 15 yeah. months, you've seen how people respond um, to whether it's governmental authority or the potential threat of a, of a disease or a pathogen or sickness. And you were talking before about people's fear. And it's it's not just the fear, it's also what people are afraid of, right? So for me, from day one on this thing, I've had a much, much, much bigger concern, and you could say fear, of the level of governmental overreach and authoritarianism yeah. and yeah. tyranny than I ever did of any yeah. any sickness or disease, right? And so that's the alarm bell I've been ringing. Whereas for other people, you know, the terror has been of other people, um, you know, the yeah. fear of other people, yeah. right? Oh my gosh, everyone now is diseased. Yeah, as if as if the government isn't other people. Mm. Like the government isn't some overarching thing filled with geniuses. It's literally just other people who mm. somehow have more power. That's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm with you there. Um for the first while, like I was in Florida, I was living with my dad. Um, and my grandparents were there. Okay. And so when this thing first hit, I was so paranoid. Mm. I was like, it was the first month there were like statistics. No one had any statistics. Right. And I was like, okay, you know, for the first, I think I joked about it for a week and then I was like, okay, this isn't going away. Mm. Um, and I was paranoid to the level of like washing grocery. Oh, like, wow. Okay. Cause I was thinking, oh no, no. I was worried because I was like, okay. if this is something like, if this is something we don't know, Yes. We don't know what it could be like. And if I get it, maybe I'll be okay. But if I transmit it to my, I was living with 80 year old grandparents. Sure, sure. And sure. my dad was like, he just had pneumonia. I was Makes like, sense. this is not good. That, and that lasted for like maybe three or four weeks, like a reasonable amount of time that I thought, okay, where's the data? Mm-hmm. Like, what's going on? There's no, like, this, this isn't that bad or people would be dying faster. Yes. Um, and then it was like we were in lockdown. I can't remember how long we were in lockdown. It was a while at the beginning. Um, and then by and then my dad was getting he was not doing well, and that was just so much worse than this that I you know got less and less and less. And then and then it started to affect the economy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, so now we're seeing the economy being impacted. So it was within the first two months, I think, two or three yeah. months. I was like, okay, it's hitting the economy. This isn't good anymore. Okay. Mm. Like if it's been three months and we're not, and there aren't bodies in the street, yeah. then what are we doing? 
Mm -hmm. And then after that, I was like, okay, that's it. We've got some statistics. It doesn't look that bad. Like I'm healthy. I'm not worried. Yeah. And so it did last. Like I was very, very paranoid at the beginning because I was Mm -hmm. like, I can't deal with something on like if my dad, you know what I was worried about? This is what I was worried about. I was worried that my dad would get sick and we'd take him to a North American hospital. And because he was doing, he was like having such a difficult time with something called akathisia. So side effects from psych meds. Mm -hmm. I was like, if they use any type of sedative to calm him down in the hospital, he'll have a paradoxical reaction Mm -hmm. and then they'll medicate that and it'll just spiral out of control, which is what had happened before. So my main fear was him getting sick, going to a hospital and then just exactly what we had seen in December, having Mm -hmm. to take him out of the hospital again. So that's why I was super, super paranoid. And then my yeah. grandparents no, were there. I th- I think, so it was a bit no, complicated. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that that makes sense. And I mean, look, everyone's got everyone's got a different situation. That, that's the thing I, I've been saying for such a long time is that people have very different situations and different risk factors, right? So if you're a 20-year-old who lives by themselves, right, that's a different situation to even a 20-year-old who lives with older parents or grandparents, mm-hmm or let alone the parents and grandparents themselves, et cetera. But also by definition, and this especially actually even goes for elderly people who are the most vulnerable. It's like, I'm also, you've made it this far, right? You've been doing risk analysis and like all human beings are, we're self-preserving. Like we're, we're not out here trying to die. So sure, you know, if some crazy mega disease came out, which is like, you know, got a 50% death rate and it's just, blowing through the population right that that's different but it came out relatively early certainly by this time last year what the actual sort of statistics were and which demographics it was affecting yeah. so it's like yeah. okay well given this data like we know who needs protecting we don't need to do this one size fits all let's just destroy let's just flatten everything in order to you know in in some feeble attempt to to stop and also just how ineffective how ineffective it's all been. That's another well, that thing. that mainly. Yeah. 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 It's just like if it worked, it'd be one thing. Like yeah, if, for if real. it worked, and- then you could at least say this works. But instead you're saying, well, we have mm. to just try harder. You guys aren't listening well enough. It's like, That's, dude, it's so how many <laughs> times do you have to do the same thing and make things worse before you realize you need a different like tactic? Yeah. It's really so, interesting. I'm so annoyed about Canada. Oh, because yeah, yeah t- tell me, because can- yeah. can- Canada's gone crazy. Canada's gone completely nuts, and specifically, like Quebec has a bad, but it's it's like specifically Toronto. Mm. So, like the one place, like in the entire world, that's really insane right now is where I went, which is like that sucks. Like, did it have to be Toronto? Like, really? Um, but like I said, they've like their business is boarded up. The there's way more homeless people. It's really sad. They're tense. It's just, and everyone's terrified. Wow. That's mainly it. Like people are terrified. Although it's been going on so long that some of the terrified people who are also kind of annoyed about it have just switched over to being angry. Gotcha. Um, the the uh, protests are are spreading. But I mean, they they suggested that police stop people outside to mm-hmm. to identify why they're outside of their house. And the Toronto police said, no, we won't be doing that. Yeah. So it, like there's a there's a huge discrepancy happening right now. Um, but things are happening like kids are being ticketed in parks. Like it's so strange. And it's May. Like we already had winter where everybody stays inside. Like people have yeah. to get outside at some point. Um, especially given the link between vitamin D and COVID. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. get people into the sun. You don't you don't really get it there. Telling people like, to stay home was like the worst advice. Po- like people it should have been go outside, not stay home. Yeah. And right? that's what the the weird thing is like, we've, we weren't that far away from a pandemic. Like there was the Spanish flu, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that happened recently enough that we can kind of look at it, although it was way worse than COVID. Oh, and no, you're not yeah, way worse. Yeah. But they, yeah, they told people to go outside, hmm. go outside even, in the sun. Don't it, stay yeah, inside. But, but even, even in our lifetimes, there's been swine flu, SARS, um, SARS Ebola didn't, yeah. uh, Ebola didn't really hit the West. Um, that was but scary, cer- cer- yeah, but certainly SARS and swine flu and bird flu, those were all like, you know, mm-hmm. significant. And yeah, it's, it's really, it's been really strange and it's been so interesting to see how different localities 
have handled it because it's almost like we're living in all these different in all these different realities. I mean, here in the UK, yeah. it looks like Canada is one of the one of the places that's the worst in the UK. Um, but I mean, it, here, like, there's no epidemic in the UK. There, the numbers are already inflated. But there were three three COVID related deaths yesterday. Three, sixty six million people, three deaths, and people are still like people are still running around like scared and ter- and and people and over 90 percent i think over 90 percent of the um people over 60 are vaccinated over half the general wow. population overnight yeah wow yeah so okay. it's like what are we okay guys it, it's over like nationally i'm not saying in the whole world because people are oh but what about india what about india i'm like bro we're in england so i can understand okay india but like <laughs> there's no epidemic here like there's no epidemic. More people died from suicide yesterday. More people died from basically everything than died from this thing yesterday. So why is all the focus still here? Like it's been so long now. People are slow. Like mm. everything in the government is slow. Like all of these changes are going to require meetings. And then the people who meet are going to have to go talk to the people above them. And the people above them are going to have to talk to people above them. And then they're going to have to be like, well, you know, I don't know. We'll Maybe we'll give it a couple of weeks. And then that has to get... <laughs> put back down to the like minions and then disseminated to the media. And then like everything is so slow. Um, At least you guys have the vaccination rollout. Like Canada's vaccination rollout was like, it was like third world country level. It's like, what have, what have you been focusing on the last year? Like what we needed to focus on was getting vaccines into the country. Assuming Mm. you're one of the people who are going to get vaccinated. That should be your goal as the government. Like if there's a pandemic, focus Mm. on getting that into the country. They're like, Oh yeah, what we forgot. Like, sorry, we were focused that, on what? Is, like, is that, sorry, we don't have any. How do you not have any? This was your one job. God. It's anyway, so it odd. seems to be rolling out in Canada. Like they said, okay. everyone's eligible for a vaccine at, by the end of May. Mm. And so, you know, everybody who wants to get one is going to go get one. And I'm I, like, I'm assuming they, they started with the older population. Yeah. So everyone above 80, 70, 60. I don't know what the vaccines are like but at least they can get them now so at least you know old folks will freaking be able to see their families again yeah. hopefully soon like it's been wild it's been yeah. so there it's been so myopic it's been so myopic yeah. and tunnel vision just like as if this is the only thing that kills people and like this is i mean yeah. they, they did some they did some surveys and like it's it's interesting i think something like um I saw this from the U.S., especially because there's such a partisan split on the issue. And it was something like over 50 percent of Democrats think that if you get covid, that um, the hospitalization rate is 50 percent or or more. Right. Like they like how bad people think really? it is. Yeah. Yeah. How bad people think, you know, and they think that the I think the majority of Democrats believe the death rate is over 10 percent. Whereas the majority of Republicans like think it's like, you know, closer to so. But again, it's because of the news people watch. Right. So if you've been sitting there for the past yeah. 18 months watching CNN and NV- MSNBC and whatever um, and having all your local politicians, you know, like pushing all these policies or whatever, people have been made yeah. to think that it's way, way, way more severe and deadly than it actually is. Like pe- people have been scared out of their wits. Um, and then there's like a whole other side. So it's almost like people are living in these alternate realities. You've got people in Florida, Texas, Georgia, tenant, like they're just chilling and having pool yeah. parties and going to nightclubs and stuff. And then I've heard that in like New York, for example, it's, you know, you, if, even if you're outside without a mask on, like people are screaming at you and stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, that's so nutty. I know it's very nutty. It's very nutty being like, I don't, I don't really like this. Like this country isn't doing it for me anymore. Maybe I'll just go to a different country where it's not like this. Mm. Like it's weird coming from North America where it's supposed to be like land of the free. It's where people who have hard times go. And it's weird being like, okay, that's not looking so good anymore. I'm going to go elsewhere. Like we mm. were in Serbia and Serbia was great. Really? I was like, Interesting. Oh, I don't want to go back to Canada. <laughs> like That's just a weird, it makes me so angry because like, You've got everything. You have a country. It's running well. You have everything set up. It's peaceful. You're just going to fuck it up. Like, it's hard to get to that point. And now, yeah. I'm, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it'll just go back to normal and maybe it will. But it's been quite a long time to shut down businesses. A lot of people have lost a lot of money. 
Um, And people, I think, have lost a lot of trust in the government from both sides, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't know. I'm more pessimistic about the state of North America, um, which is probably why I'm in Dubai. Yeah, it it is sad. Because like you said, I mean, the the Western world has made fought so hard to make so many strides and freedoms. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's crazy. You know, people used to fight for freedom. Now, if you fight for freedom, you're the bad guy. That's been the weirdest thing to me over the past year is like, I've been trying to fight to uphold people's rights and civil liberties. And that's somehow made me the enemy to so many of my countrymen and even people overseas. It's like, People are so desperate to lose their rights and to have everyone else is taken. You know, that person should have to do this and, should, and shouldn't be allowed to yeah, do this. And shouldn't it's be, like lose, right? lose your own it's rights. Crazy. Like if you want to yeah. lose your rights, go ahead. Like lose your rights, stay inside your house, freaking order yeah. food, have groceries delivered to your door, watch Netflix, wear a mask, do whatever you want. Just mm-hmm. don't bug me about it. Yeah. Like I'm not bugging you about it. Maybe I'm bugging you about it on social media. I don't yeah. know, but like, just don't don't take away my rights for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, you're gonna have um, a lot of. I don't know. I think there's gonna be some interesting migrations over the past over, over the next few years. I think you're gonna see a lot of people moving out of big cities and more yeah. into uh, suburbia or the middle of nowhere. I see a big exodus from major cities. That's gonna happen. And I also think you're going to have an increasing number of people immigrating from so-called first world countries to um, so-called second and third world countries for a lot of reasons, especially people who are able to be a bit more nomadic like we are. Um, yeah, I mean, I we're in a bit of a different more. situation, right? Because we are because we've but, got like mm. online sources of income and mm. the I mean, I'm not saying other people can't have that. I'm just saying lots of people don't have that. Yeah. You can have that. Mm. But um, but it's it's hard and it well, a lot of people work. are even even <laughs> if people are still employed. I mean, a lot of people have shifted to remote working, and I've seen that yeah. in different countries, like in in um in Dubai, um in places like Barbados, I've seen that they are doing sort of they're introducing new types of visa, so that yeah, if you can you know work from home, yeah, exactly. So I think that hopefully will be I guess what is a positive that comes out of this, but it is disheartening to see countries which supposedly were supposed to be the bastions of freedom, UK, USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I mean, people are there talking about, oh my gosh, Australia and New Zealand have handled it so well. I'm like, they can't leave their country. (laughs) Like you can't leave New Zealand. So I don't know if that's handling it well, like making it illegal to leave the country. I mean, sure, you have a lower death rate. I mean, you've also got 20 people on an island in the middle of nowhere. So you can't really compare it to a lot of other places. But to me, I'm like, that's not good. Like, that's not handling it well. Um, That's just going authoritarian, like properly. And people don't like the terms authoritarian and totalitarian. But if we're not using, yeah. yeah, but if we're not using them now, like, when do we use them? Like, the government is literally telling you, you cannot go outside your house. You can't see your friends. You can't see your family. You're not allowed to hug people. You're not allowed to open your business. You can't travel. You can't leave. The... How is that not totalitarian? Like that's yeah. literally even even that during wartime, totally. they don't have all these rules. Yeah. Part, part of the reason uh, we left too was because, you know, they opened up slightly and then they were like, oh my God, the second wave. And I was like, oh no, like right now, if you have business, you can leave the country to certain countries. Okay. And I was like, if they do another stay at home mandate, and they could, because there were, there were talks coming out and they're like, we're not doing the lockdown properly, even though we'd been a, a, in a stay at home mandate for like three or four months, um, which is a very long time. They're like, we're not doing it properly. We're going to have to impose stricter rules. And I was, and then they have this quarantine. I mean, you guys have a quarantine too. And some, mm-hmm. and lots of countries have a quarantine, but they had this quarantine. And I, I was like, oh my God, are they going to shut down airports? Am I not? Am I going to be stuck in this? stupid city for i don't know three more months or four more months i was like i'm just gonna go and wait because it'll probably fix itself eventually it's just sad that it got to that point and that nobody freaked out about it i think you made the right move so michaela what have you um what else have you got coming up so you're working on your book of course you've got your podcast which is going and growing and doing really well uh what else do you have on the horizon um man i have an app 
So I'm okay. working on an app with my dad um, and one of his graduate students, uh, PhD graduate students, uh, and it's on resilience. So what it does, I really, I'm really excited about this. What it does is it helps you identify areas in your life that need work. So it, it'll do like, you know, how's your, how's your career going or your love life or your health, or you, there's like eight categories to identify where you want to focus. And then it breaks that down further. So you can identify, oh, you know, like my job is where what's causing most of my distress. And then it runs you through ways to solve your problem. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, it's also going to have a bit of a, it's going to be able to allow you to connect with someone so that you can have someone who is like your accountability partner mm -hmm. if you want. Mm -hmm. But um, it's at the, I think that it'll be out in about four months. Um, we're calling it AIM. AIM, okay. And... I think it's going to be good. It's still, it's still in the early stages. Like I just took a look at the wireframe and we're still going back and forth on exactly what we want to be in it. But, um, we're very excited about that. Awesome. And what so about the book? Do you have a plan for when that's going to come out? Well, I have a publishing company. Um, it's actually, it's Libra. Um, and Tucker Max is like on the board there. Oh, interesting. Okay. He has, he, yeah, he has this company called Scribe, but he has this other company called Libra. I'm going to go with them. Okay. Um, they have, they're just way better than regular publishers in my opinion. So I'm going with them. I'm going to finish it up in the next month. Then it's going to be a hell of a lot of editing because I think half of it needs to be just thrown away. I need to give it to someone and say like how much of this is interesting and how much of it is just trauma <laughs> and just like get rid of some. Um, so that's the next step. Um, but okay. in the next year I should have an app out. I should have my book out. Um, I should, my podcast is growing and then I'm still running my dad's um, three online products and social media and touring and books. And so it's a lot, but it's fun right now. Awesome. Awesome. Michaela. Always good to talk to you. Really good to have you on the show. Thank you. And we will talk again soon. We should. Thank you, Zuby, for inviting me. You're most welcome.